Hello, hello, humans. Thais Sky here. Welcome to Reclaim the Podcast. I'm really excited for the guest that I have on this week, Laura Mohai. We talk about trauma in the world of social justice, in the world of yoga. We talk about uh, one of the more the lesser well-known trauma responses, fawning, and what that looks like, how that plays out. I mean, the conversation is just so delightful. Laura is just such a wonderful soul. It was a really good conversation. Um, So uh, that's coming in just a minute. Welcome to Reclaim, a podcast for women by women on conversations that matter. I am your host, Thais Skye, international speaker, teacher, and a certified life coach currently working to become a licensed psychotherapist in the state of California. Join me here every week as I offer thoughts and interviews on what it means to reclaim your humanness in this messy world. Um, But first, 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 just want to share some really important announcements coming out of Toy Sky Inc. (laughs) Uh, News number one, I um, have been working really hard to create a ebook for you to download on my website. It's going to be called Reclaiming Worth. I made some mentions of it a few months ago, um, and then I haven't really talked about it since because I've been talking more about my mentorship, but uh, it is finally officially coming next week. So make sure you go to my website, thaissky.com forward slash worth. So that's thaissky.com forward slash worth um, for you to get on the list to get that opt-in that the ebook I'm creating is going to be really wonderful because it's going to talk about my top five thoughts on what it means to reclaim your worth I'm going to be sharing um, so many of my um, ideas that I've formulated around this idea of the worthiness wound it's going to it's the first place outside of worthy women rise where you're going to find everything about the worthiness wound in one place Um, well not everything I mean that's going to be a whole book coming out soon 2022 just kidding. Haven't started writing that, but I do have intentions of writing that book at some point in the future. Um, but this is a really good place to start to get some knowledge and insights about the worthiness wound. I also talk about habits of worth and the ways that you can begin to infuse worth into your life. So go to tayskycom forward slash worth to get on the list. That's coming out next week. Okay. Um, news number two, my group mastermind mentorship is now halfway fold. So um, there are, are two spots left for the group mentorship. Um, the mentorship, if you are new to the podcast, is for coaches who do deep healing work and want supervision support for that deep healing work, particularly if you're holding space for trauma, if you're holding space for addiction, um, if you're going into uh, your client's unconscious as a coach, it is absolutely imperative to receive supervision support, not from the lens of here's, you know, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it bad, you're a bad coach, because I understand that like the, the world of coaching is so private. It's so intimate Um, and opening someone up to have access to um, your intimate coaching work is vulnerable. I get that. But that's not what supervision is for. It's not to be criticized. It's to be offered different insights and ideas and perspectives on what's happening between you and the client so that you can go um, into areas that you may not have thought of to go to. I mean, the holding space as a human is complex. We all need support in that complexity. And so that's what mentorship is all about. So you can learn more about that at taisky.com forward slash mentorship, um, where you can get all the information and you can apply. Okay, let's see if there's any other news. Um, worthiness season is coming up next uh, in two weeks, I believe. We're going to kick off worthiness season because the next uh, cohort of Worthy Women Rise is going to be open. Um, I'm really excited about this this cohort, this upcoming cohort of Worthy Women Eyes, because for the first time, I am making this a year-long experience. I've been wanting to make it a year-long experience for a long time now, but I've had to do my own work and figure out my own worth around it and my own intimacy. And it is now that time uh, where I'm feeling really confident that a year-long container is exactly what the world needs to create, you know, support tending to and healing the worthiness wound so we can get out of our own way. So if you've been 
been thinking about joining Worthy Women Rise, this is your invitation to do that. You can actually go to worthywomenrise.com and apply, even though doors officially don't open for another two weeks. Um, I have just opened it up on my website. So you can go learn more about that program. Um, and that's for anybody, right? Any woman who is on the journey of reclaiming their worth, this program may be a good fit for you. Okay, so beyond those three things, I think that's it in terms of news. Let's bring Laura on. Um, Laura is a trauma-informed yoga teacher. She's a filmmaker and an advocate for survivors of trauma. She is actually a survivor herself and shares a little bit about her own story of trauma. And we talk about what it means to be trauma-informed, not from just one perspective, like in the coaching work, but as a life, um, as a way of seeing yourself and seeing the world. It's a really beautiful conversation. I know you're going to love it. Uh, So yeah, let's get right into it. Okay. Hello, Laura. Welcome to Reclaim the Podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I've been really anticipating this conversation. Um, I really resonate with so much that you write on social media. That tends to be where I, I find my guests is on social media and like that resonance, you know, that sense of like, yes, this person gets my language. This person gets what I, how the way I see things and can verbalize it in a really beautiful way. And you are one of those humans. So thank you for everything that you write and <laughs> post and do and share in the world. It's so appreciated. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So for people who are not familiar with you, just give a little bit of a background on who are, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so my name is Laura. I was born in Romania. Um, I'm a yoga teacher primarily. I also have a background in filmmaking. Um, and yeah, I'm really, really interested in trauma-informed ways of life and trauma-informed psychology, um, mindfulness kind of like emotions, dealing with our emotions, things like that. Yeah. So that's about me. (laughs) Yeah. What, what got you? Okay. First let's like define, like, how do you define trauma informed? Like, what does that mean to you to be trauma informed? Yeah. Um, I think it's just like being mindful of how our trauma responses of, first of all, what is trauma, uh, what our trauma response is and how our trauma responses are showing up both in ourselves and within other people. I would say that that's like the overarching way that I would explain it. Why, why trauma? Like, (laughs) that's a silly question, (laughs) but like what, what connected you to this lens of trauma informed work? Like what about it really resonates with you or how did you get yourself how did you find yourself in this space? Yeah, so I'm a survivor myself. So I think it was like inevitable that I was going to come here. Um, so that's one of like the main things. But I, I think I first found out about it through my yoga training. So my, my first yoga training that I did that was 200 hour wasn't trauma informed. Um, and I would actually say that a lot of the stuff that I learned there was like opposite, the opposite of trauma informed. And being a survivor, I was kind of like, uh, I don't know about this. This doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but then I was told that like, oh, there's actually additional trainings that you can do that are specifically trauma informed, like trauma informed yoga. And so I started seeking those and adding those into my repertoire. And then I think it's just been like a big, um, search afterward. Um, and I've been like, just trying to read on my own, like every book that I can find on trauma, on complex trauma, complex PTSD, and kind of just, um, processing it, processing it on my own and also like processing it in terms of like externally and how I like see the world. Yeah, it's really interesting, right, that yoga isn't inherently trauma-informed, or at least the Western (laughs) version of of yoga isn't trauma-informed, and that it's kind of sad that you even have to add that as a descriptor, right, trauma-informed yoga. And I think that can be very disorienting for people who have experienced trauma who go to yoga thinking that it's going to it be inherently a safe space for them to land and then realize, oh, wait, um, it's not. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think in a way it's like misadvertising um, because it's yoga is supposed to be a healing space and it is about healing. And so if it's not trauma informed and it's not tr- uh, friendly to survivors, then it's like, it's, it can't be a safe space. It can't be a healing space. So we have to be very, very mindful um, as teachers that we're teaching in a trauma-informed way and that we're also doing our own inner work, our own shadow work around trauma. Yeah, what, 
did you find in that initial yoga teacher training where you're like, oh, this doesn't feel right for me and is quite the opposite of what trauma-informed language is? Yeah. So like one big thing was um, consent around hands-on adjustments. Yes. And I I remember bringing that up being a survivor. I'm like, I don't think we should be touching people without their consent. And some people who have PTSD might be actually triggered by hands-on adjustments. So they have to be able to say no. And also there's like people who they just don't want to be touched. And I think it's okay to like, actually, we should be asking people if we, if it's okay to touch them, whether or not they have trauma, you know? Yeah. Um, And I remember like bringing that stuff up and it was actually like, I was being met with a lot of dismissal from yoga teachers. And that was quite frankly, for me as a survivor, it was a bit re-traumatizing. Um, I think another thing that I met was a lot of toxic positivity and spiritual bypassing. So <laughs> yeah, a lot of like, um, it, law of attraction stuff, honestly, that was like, oh, you should just ignore your feelings and that's how you'll feel better. You just ignore your, all of Which your bad Which does feelings. work, you know, for like a second. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. A second, but it's not trauma informed. Um, so, so that was, I would say spiritual bypassing, toxic positivity, consent. And also I think that like more recently finding out that a lot of like the gurus who brought yoga over to the States were actually, um, ended up being like sexual abusers. Um, there was like, a that was hidden, you yes. know? And I think we need to be honest and have a real conversation about that. Yeah, I watched a documentary on Chaudhry Bikram and, you know, everything that I watched in the documentary that didn't surprise me. And it also is surprising because the narrative is very much that yoga came to the West by these very enlightened individuals, right? And so that's the kind of narrative that's, this is where the complexity arises because in one on one level reverence to yoga as a non western practice right and as a a, pro, a healing modality and, and spiritual tradition and ritual that is not western and so honoring that and honoring the roots of that and not butchering that like the way we butcher sanskrit and the way that we butcher the practices of yoga and bastardize it right make it western holding that complexity with the fact that the men who did bring not all, of course, but the may, big names of men who brought yoga over to the West were sexual abusers and have got, you know, gotten into trouble. Well, some of them have gotten into trouble and have had um, women come forward and say that what they did was not okay. And that's complicated, right? Like uh, th- these are all complicated things. And like, how do we hold nuance to both the origins of but also holding people accountable and responsible for their behavior. Yeah, exactly. You nailed it. It's really, um, I want to back up because so much of what you said was really potent. And it's a question I have for you. I'm curious your thoughts on this. You know, we, I, in, in trauma-informed yoga, consent is really a big deal, particularly touch. And we also know that a trauma response tends to be fawn. Um, which for those of you who are listening, fawn is a nervous system response. It's people-pleasing behavior, but from a nervous system response. Correct me if I'm missing something, Laura. Um, so how do we ground in what we in giving consent in a situation where we may feel pressured to allow the yoga teacher to touch and not wanting to be difficult, you know, not wanting to be that person that gets kind of the special treatment? if that is our nervous system response? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So I feel like I kind of answered this for myself through trial and error as a teacher. So at first when I started, I think I I was just asking people verbally. So I would be like approaching people um, and asking them, may I give you an adjustment? And they can say yes or no. Or I would um, ask everyone at the beginning of class to like, close their eyes for a minute. And if they didn't want adjustment to um, like cross their heart. Um, And then I would kind of memorize who didn't want um, (laughs) adjustments. And then that would be in a discreet way because everyone had their eyes closed. Yeah. Um, Sometimes that could be tricky when you have bigger classes because it's just hard to remember like, Oh, who, what was their placement? Like, where were they? So I actually think that my favorite way of asking for consent are using consent cards. Yeah. um, Which like are these little coasters basically and they have yes for hands-on adjustments or no 
Um, and that way I feel like that's actually a lot less pressure and um, because it's discreet, people don't have to actually use their voice or say anything. They don't have to draw, draw attention to themselves and it's at the top of their mat. So I can always kind of just check before I come in. If it says no, I just won't give an adjustment. If they have it to yes, I usually get, we'll like double, uh, we'll get double consent. So um, I'll still ask again and I'll try to make it more specific. Like, can I give you a shoulder adjustment? Can I give you a this adjustment? So that people can say uh, no, because sometimes like they're open to adjustments in general, but they're like, oh, I actually don't want a shoulder adjustment on my right shoulder because I have an yes. injury or something like that. Yes, I love that. And as you we were talking, I, you know, I used to be a yoga teacher. I don't know if you know this, but I used to be a yoga teacher and um, the yoga studio that I taught at, I have a dear friend who has brought trauma informed um, yoga to the studio and she started instilling these cards and um, little um, rocks. You know, you put a rock on your mat or you put it underneath the mat. And I just find that that is so innovative. And I wish that I had that when I was practicing more devoutly, because especially in, in studios in New York City, where there's like a 100 people, you know, and it's these huge packed classes. And I used to go and there used to be such a rush to go to these big classes. But these teachers don't know me, they, they know nothing about my body. And particularly like the male um, teachers or, or the male students that would go around and do the adjustments while the teacher teaches like I was uncomfortable with that I don't know you I don't have a relationship with you um and been able to put something on my mat would have just been so wonderful and I hope that these yoga studios now are doing that because I haven't gone in a long time but um I love that that that's that that has landed right for you because as I was listening I was like yes I remember that and I love that and I think that that's such a great way to not have to tell an authority figure no you know, because that's really confronting for people. A yoga teacher, a teacher is an authority figure. And even if we don't want that power dynamic, it is inherent in the relationship. And knowing that, that people are going to have a hard time standing up or saying no, some of them won't have that issue and some of them will. And being able to have space where all those people are welcome is important. So I love that. Yeah, I completely agree. And I will say that I have noticed, so I tried, I've tried stones, I've tried coasters, um, I've tried like verbal consent. I've also tried just not giving adjustments. And some, some days I'm like, I'm not in the mood. So I'm like, I'm no adjustments today for anyone, <laughs> you know, or if I'm like getting over a cold or something like that. Um, but I, I, the reason that I like the coasters more is because I've noticed that there's more people saying no. Mm. you know and it's it's like there's something about the coasters that make people more comfortable or more safe or more assured to saying no so that's how I know it's probably the best way yeah or um if you're working with like specifically like this is what I'm talking about is more like public classes where you're going to get a mix of like survivors and non-survivors but if you're yeah. working specifically with survivors and hands-on adjustments are not recommended yes that is important to yeah. know and and it's really interesting because you know, when we become aware and sensitive to this, we can then make touch be such a therapeutic thing because touch is so mm -hmm. important. But we have to, I'm talking we as an authority figures, have to be mindful that it's probably not going to be coming from us that's going to make it therapeutic, right? It's the survivor. It's the, the person who has experienced a trauma. It's, it's their world and who they allow to, uh, to make touch be a really important therapeutic thing in their lives. But it, the, the autonomy to make that decision lies on them and not on us. Who are we to say that, you know, touching is therapeutic if we don't even know the person or know what they've been through. Exactly. It's like if, if they haven't consented to the touch in that kind of space and that kind of dynamic where there is a power dynamic, as you were saying, it's actually not therapeutic if there's right. no consent. It's the opposite of therapeutic if there's no consent around it. Right. Yes. I love that. And so moving the conversation from just trauma-informed yoga, I'm curious what it means for you to be just trauma informed in your life for, for yourself and for others. Yeah, I think it has, <laughs> I'm like still trying to figure that out. You know? <laughs> I'll be like completely honest that it's, it's like an ongoing learning and unlearning and, and making new connections in my brain and like just using this new lens. Um, a lot of it has to do with like 
options, thinking about options, thinking about how everyone in my life has options to do things. And I'm not allowed to tell anyone what they're supposed to be doing or, you know what I mean? They have to be able to make choices for themselves. Um, uh, like noticing my own nervous system, noticing when my, like, I, I think a big part of it is just like noticing my own trauma responses and being like, this is the freeze response or like, I'm fawning. That's why I didn't set that boundary <laughs> or yes. like, you know, I'm, I'm slipping into workaholism. This is also a trauma response. I'm avoiding my feelings. Um, and just like having more touch with like my body, my nervous system, my inner child, all of that has been like really, really helpful. Um, because I think when I'm healthier, I can also approach the world in a healthier way. Yeah. Yeah. And what I think is really helpful about this is it helps us to remove some of the feelings that there's something wrong with us for responding the way that we respond. Um, I know that a lot of the people I work with and myself included, I'll just name this for myself. You know, the, the tendency I have is to think that there's something wrong with me because I'm, I have too many feelings, right? That tends to be my MO. I wish I was chill. I wish I was easier going. I wish I wasn't so difficult. I wish I didn't have so many feelings about this thing. You know, this is particularly true um, when attending like family type events, whether it's my family, someone else's family, where there's some obligation underlying the relationship. Like you have to stay, you have to eat a certain way, you have to do things in certain ways. Um, and like, if there's no out, if I can't opt out, of something, I tend to get very anxious. And I had this experience. I went to um, visit my partner's mother um, and I had leftovers. We had eaten on the road. And so I had leftovers and I put it in the fridge. And then it was dinner time. And I had been thinking about my leftovers because I'm like, it was really, really yummy um, Mexican food. It was like <laughs> rice and beans. I'm like, oh, so good. And like, I knew that like whatever dinner was, I wanted to have the autonomy to also have my leftovers. And, you know, there was this moment of feeling like, is that okay? That's not okay. Because there's these underlying assumptions of what it means to have leftovers at the table. Does it mean that I don't respect her or her food, et cetera? And that caused a lot of anxiety within me. I noticed myself getting very activated. My nervous system was feeling like I was in defense mode, like I had to fight for my food. And that was all so interesting for me to be aware of because then I could make, like you said, like I could make more choices. I could decide what I wanted to do and how I wanted to give myself freedom. But I feel like if I didn't have that knowledge, I would have approached that situation from the lens of like, why am I so difficult? Why can't I just eat what everyone else is eating? No one else seems to have this issue. Everyone else is fine with eating what they're served. Why do I have to be the difficult one? Yeah, I think I think being trauma informed can make us be more compassionate, more towards ourselves and other people, and kind of realizing that a lot of times I think we berate ourselves for our trauma responses, and that's yeah. not really fair, you know. Um, like I, I know that freeze is one of my trauma responses, and I just get like sleepy sometimes. Like if I get overwhelmed, I like my body's like it's time for you to take a nap, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that sometimes that kind of response is often interpreted as laziness, you know? Um, and it's like, it's actually not laziness. It's actually just um, being too activated or being too overstimulated or too emotional and, and, and kind of like your body just getting like a little limp and sleepy. Mm -hmm. um, so like, that's just an example. But I think like n knowing your trauma responses can help us both be more compassionate towards ourselves, but also hold us accountable too. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's the idea is to be able to not be like a passenger in your own life or to not let someone else like write your own life. Like you get to be the writer of your own life. You get yes. to be the writer of your own book and yes. yeah, being self-aware about trauma. It's like, we can start to be a little bit like, okay, I'm, I'm feeling this freeze response coming or I'm feeling this fight response coming or I'm feeling this workaholism coming. Like is there anything that I can do to kind of like shift, you know, shift away from this? Like, yes. how can I calm my own nervous system so I can actually like uh, steer my boat, I guess? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And for me, in that moment, I was recognizing that I wanted my initial take always is like that people pleaser, you know, like it's fine. It's not a big deal. I'm not a big deal. 
and just really owning that like people are allowed to be uncomfortable by my preferences, you know, like people are allowed to have their own feelings. Like if my boyfriend's mother, you know, had issue, like felt certain things about the fact that like I chose to eat her food as well as mine, then she's allowed to have those feelings and she's allowed to talk to me about them. And I'm happy to answer questions about how I've had eating disorder in the past. And like, I need freedom with my food. Um, but, but we don't even really give people that chance. Do we, Laura? Like we really try to manage other people's feelings and like live our lives so that we don't make any ripples. And like, like trusting that people can handle their emotions has been so liberatory for me to like really focus on like my regulation instead of other people regulation. And I feel like that's also being trauma informed is like really recognizing what's mine and what's not mine. You know, like how this person feels is not really my business until they bring it in until they name it. But while it's in that mind reading place, like I'm not going to sit here and try to make a lot of assumptions about what this person's experiencing because I have no control over that. Right, exactly. And I think it's like you set a boundary and boundaries are trauma informed. You held ownership, like autonomy over your body and what goes in your body, like food, that's also body autonomy. And, you know, you were like, no, this is my body autonomy. This is what I'm eating. And, you know, does it cause somebody to feel some type of way? Yes, but that's also not yours, yeah. <laughs> right? So yeah. because you didn't do anything wrong. All you did was set a boundary and you asserted your uh, right. body, bodily autonomy. So, right. yeah. So, you know, a lot of questions I get is that is around the idea of fawn because this is a relatively newer of the fight, flight, freeze, F. Um, which is, you know, what, what is fawning? How do I know if I'm fawning, you know, and like, what does it mean to manage my fawningness? And I'm curious your thoughts or responses to that. Yeah, sure. So this is definitely one of mine, uh, big, big, big time. <laughs> and I, it, It's like, it has a lot to do with like, placating other people's emotions, um, de-escalating situations um, so that we can um, minimize the harm that comes our way. Um, and it, it sometimes it can be, you know, sort of like controlling of other people's emotions, but I would say that there are other types of fawning that it is actually like, I just want to de-escalate because this is scary. Yes. Um, yeah. So it's, 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 um, and I think the biggest thing is to be aware of it when it's happening to realize, oh, and actually another like simple way to think about it is that fawning is very like excessively others focused. So it's good to be like balanced in terms of how much time we think about ourselves, our needs, our boundaries, and also how much time we're like thinking about other people and their needs and boundaries and things like that. And I think in our, in all relationships, especially intimate relationships, it's important to have a balance, right? Like, we have to think about ourselves, our emotional needs, what we want, what we need. We also have to think about like, is my partner <laughs> happy too? You know, mm -hmm. like it's just a balance. It's a balancing act. Like thinking too much about ourselves and disregarding our partner would not be good. Thinking too much about our partner, but not enough about ourselves is also not good. So both of these are two different um, imbalances. I think with fawning, uh, there's a tendency in relationships to always be focused on other people, other people's happiness, other people's emotional needs, other people's boundaries, but not enough on one's own boundaries and own, your own emotional needs. Yeah. I um, tend to equate fawning with like what dogs tend to do when you hit a dog. Mm -hmm. And like, I always, I hate the visual, but it, it is such <gasps> a powerful, I know, but I, I think it also offers like people a really powerful perspective of like, you know, you hit a dog. It's obviously not all dogs. Some dogs get, you know, bite you back, but most dogs have been trained to at least, you know, fawn where they put their tail between their legs and they actually come closer to you, which is such an audac audacious move, isn't it? Like, you know, here's a human who's clearly shown that they are willing to hurt this animal and the animal moves closer towards the, the perpetrator. Um, and, 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 you know, puppy dog eyes, ears back, tail between their legs. Sometimes they flip over and show their belly. It's essentially saying like, I'm not going to harm you. Please don't harm me. You know, I'm nice, I'm sweet, I'm kind, I'm innocent, I'm naive, I'm, please don't hurt me. Um, and I think that, you know, he, we can watch humans do similar things to each other. 
Um, and it's also equally heartbreaking when you're watching Fawn in action because you can just tell, you can just watch this person completely lose their power, lose their sense of self, lose their fullness, and they become this kind of shriveled in that moment, right? These the shriveled, small, um, complacent, compl- you know, uh, individual who's like, please don't hurt me. And it's really painful of a dynamic. It's painful to watch. And it's important to know when that plays out within ourselves so that we can really take good care of ourselves and, and find other ways to respond so that we can um, – be grounded and, and not necessarily have to acquiesce to somebody else. Yeah, totally. I totally agree. And I think that that metaphor image or analogy about the dog that's in the kind of, you know, way that they're trained is pretty right on. And sadly, a lot of folks who were on the receiving end of a lot of childhood abuse and childhood complex trauma can also develop as fawns. Um, yeah. 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 So I think that being aware of the phone response when it's popping up is really important, but so is doing like the really, really, really deep complex trauma and trauma work, trauma therapy. Um, because it's like, if that part isn't being addressed to then the root of it isn't, isn't being pulled out. And if the root isn't being pulled out, it just kind of keeps growing back up like a weed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you sharing. Um, that kind of trauma informed lens. Cause I think that that kind of perfectly ties into something that I've been a conversation I've been watching you have a lot recently. Um, I know you've been having this conversations way before recently, but most recently you've been really talking about thinking about online, um, the intersection of social justice and trauma informed lens or trauma informed work. Um, and like, what does it mean for us to be navigating these really complex conversations from a trauma-informed space where we can hold our humanity and the humanity of others? Um, and I'm, yeah, let's get into like, I'm, I'm curious what, what your thoughts are on that right now. Yeah, sure. So right now we don't really have like a blueprint for trauma-informed social justice or trauma-informed activism or trauma-informed um, like allyship, but that is something that I'm, I'm hoping that we will have. And I think we need to keep having conversations with each other. And I'm, I'm, I'm really, really interested in this um, piece of it. And I feel that I'm very, very ready for it. Um, I'm not sure exactly what it's going to look like. I don't have all the answers, but I can say for sure that trauma is an intersection and I think it needs to be seen as an intersection, um, like definitely complex trauma, but simple trauma as well. I also think that another big piece to it is that white supremacy is traumatizing. You know, patriarchy Mm -hmm. is traumatizing. And so an effect of white supremacy and an effect of patriarchy is trauma for people of color and women respectively. Um, But I would also say that like white people who are white supremacists, especially when you go back in the history they traumatized people of color in order to kind of put them into submission. And I think that men do this as well. They traumatize women in order to get their submission. It goes back to that fawn response or freeze because when you're freeze, you're collapsing and freeze is sometimes like when your body actually can't make it. If you're still in fight or flight mode, your body is still kind of fighting for itself. But if you're in fawn, if you're in freeze mode, then it's like your body has actually completely given up. Yeah. And it's really, really sad. And so if white supremacy is traumatizing and uses trauma as a tool to subjugate, and if patriarchy is traumatizing and it uses trauma as a tool to subjugate, how can our activism and social justice be trauma-informed? That's the question. Yeah. Yes. And I have here a set of slides that I want to read. I wonder if you you've probably saw it, but I think it's really important to ground ourselves in this. Um, it's written by Kay Chang. Um, And they wrote, I think the major difference between a social justice and a white colonial lens on trauma is the assumption that trauma recovery is a reclamation of safety. That safety is a resource that is simply out there for the taking and all we need to do is work hard enough at therapy. I was once at a training seminar in Toronto led by a famous among therapists and beloved somatic psychologist. She spoke brilliantly. I asked her how healing from trauma was possible for people for whom violence and danger was a part of everyday life. She said that it wasn't. Colonial psychology and psychiatry reveal their allegiance to the status quo in their approach to trauma. 
that resourcing must come from within oneself rather than from the collective. That trauma recovery is feeling safe in society when in fact society is the source of trauma. Colonial somatics and psychotherapies teach that the body must relearn to perceive safety, but the bodies of the op oppressed are rightly interpreting danger. Our trigger and explosive rage, our dissociation and perfect submission are in fact skills that have kept us alive. The somatics of social justice cannot, I believe, be a somatic, somatics rooted in the colonial framework of psychology, psychiatry, and other models linked to the dominance of the nation, nation state. Ooh, it gets heady here, but we're going to keep going. The somatics of social justice cannot be aimed at restoring the body to a state of homeostasis neutrality. We must be careful of popular languaging such as the regulation of nervous system and emotion, which implies the control and domination of mind over emotion and sensation because we are not, in the end, preparing the body to return to the general safety of society. This would be gaslighting. We are preparing the body and essentially the body essentially for struggle training to, for better survival and the ability to experience joy in the midst of great danger. In the cauldron of social justice healing praxis, we must aim for relationality that has the potential to generate social change, to generate insurrection. We must be prepared to challenge norms, acknowledge danger, embrace risks, or embrace struggles, take risks. And above all, we must not overemphasize the importance of individual work to the detriment of somatics that also prepare us essentially for war. Somatics that allow us to organize together, fight together, live together, love together. Um, just a couple more. Somatics under capitalism becomes just another psychotherapy trend. It becomes absorbed into the body of colonial healing praxis and loses its revolutionary power. But cultural somatics is not about winning the game or becoming the next big name. As much as we love Levine, Van der Kolk, Fisher, Ogden, etc., cultural somatics is about rewilding our bodies, rebuilding our wolf pack and lion's pride. Um, the ultimate question of social justice somatics is the most important thing, I think, from the whole thing. is not how can we cure traumatized bodies so we can return to productive society, the question of dominant psychology, right? The question is how can we heal our traumatized bodies so that we may love each other and fight together? Okay, so I wanted to share all that just to contextualize also that when we're talking about trauma and trauma-informed, we want to be mindful, right, to not to not perpetuate this idea that there can be a normalized body in systems of society that is inherently traumatic. If white supremacy is trauma and it causes trauma to all humans in different respects, in different ways, then how can we um, create, like, find a normalization within ourselves within these broken systems? So <laughs> that was a long way of saying that, but I think it's important to ground ourselves in that and in this conversation because I think it really forces us to confront a different reality instead of becoming better fishes in the sea when we're not fishes at all, you know, how can we be land animals? How can we thrive? How can we create systems that thrive and honoring that the, the fact that we're experiencing trauma in our body means that there's something wrong in our system. Yeah. I mean, I completely, I love that quote. I love all of that. I hadn't heard it before. And oh, so, so good. I, it's so good. Um, yeah. And I had a lot of problem with this, with this approach, um, through yoga, because I do think that it's constantly seeing this as like, oh, if you're traumatized, all you got to do is get trauma therapy or do yoga. And then racism won't bother you, won't bother you anymore. Patriarchy right. won't bother you anymore. And that's actually really ridiculous. Um, and I also think that what, what that's inherently saying is that like, okay, Sorry, my mind just like always goes to like 500 no. places at once. <laughs> That's how my mind works. But I think that there's two approaches that we need. One is like actually healing the trauma. So if you're a marginalized person is like then healing from racial trauma or healing from the patriarchal trauma or healing from the trauma of homophobia, et cetera, et cetera. Right. That's one part of it. But if we don't address the systemic issue, then what's happening is like you're having people who are healing and then they're going back into the world and they're getting re-traumatized. Yes. And then they got to go back into EMDR and do trauma therapy and heal from that. And then they got to go back into the world and get re-traumatized. Like that just doesn't work. That's not sustainable. And I don't think that that's the end goal. So I think that we need to work on this. It, it needs to be a two-part approach. One, in making mental health care more accessible, making mental health care trauma-informed, making mental health care understand systemic issues so that marginalized people can go and get trauma therapy that might be specific having to do with their, like, systemic oppression and making that accessible, like, financially accessible, et cetera, et cetera. But then the second approach is has to do with, like, okay, we got to fix our issues in society. That's yeah. what needs to happen. Yes, 100%. And I find that 
you know, this idea of being trauma informed is quite revolutionary in a way in the world of social justice, because I think, you know, there so much conversations that I see stem out of social justice is very much embedded in, in trauma, right? Where there's a lot of reactivity going because there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of violence, there's a lot of angst. Um, and I'm speaking for all, you know, for all people, but in different levels and different ways. And so it's difficult to know how to have these conversations when our nervous system is so activated. I mean, I know personally, again, I will only speak for me, is that when I woke up to my whiteness a few years ago, um, I remember watching about a year into my awakening, watching um, a, a white woman kind of get burned down because of her, um, because of the mistakes that she made. And yeah, so watching this white woman's business completely burned down, I became terrified that I was going to be next because I was still so new to all of this. I was still so new to waking up to my whiteness, to recognizing and naming all the ways that I have caused harm. And I developed, I mean, really... A, a lot of fear every time I came on social media, right? Like I nervous, noticed myself getting really shaky and I started having some nightmares. I just started having a lot of feelings around what was happening online and, and, and having to like stay in the fire, right? Like having to learn how to regulate myself um, and, and fortify myself as a white woman to have conversations about race, which to me at the time was brand new. So it was very confronting. But, but I can see that how I got through it was through knowing my nervous system and, and being able to ground myself. And I think what is happening is that a lot, of, a lot of white women don't have that knowledge, don't have a way of, of sitting with their shame, of grounding in their nervous system without it taking over. And so there's a, there's a lot of reactivity there, whether it's defensiveness or fragility or whatever you want to name it, and perpetual harm to repeat towards people of color and black people specifically black women specifically um and that's why i think on on one sliver trauma-informed conversation tra having tra a trauma-informed lens can be really instrumental and important in supporting white people waking up yes i completely agree about that um yeah and we we hear this term white fragility a lot right but what's the solution to white fragility is white people developing emotional resiliency yeah and understanding their nurse nervous system understanding their nervous uh system trauma stress responses yes and also understanding their own trauma if they have trauma yes. um because I, I really i've said this before on my page and i will keep saying it that I, I really think that we as white people doing anti-racist work, we actually can't do allyship bypassing, yeah. which is like, we're going to, you know, show up in anti-racist places and be an ally. And, but if we're actually bypassing like the, the trauma that we may or may not have in our childhoods or whenever, um, we are not going to be super effective allies in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And you know, I think that that becomes really helpful because then we have a system forward. We have a way forward. White people don't have to be demoralized and, and um, like retract from the shame and not wake up because we can say, no, this is a part of the process, but there are actual steps that you can take you're not going to be like this forever. These feelings aren't going to feel like this way forever. And also there will be a, you do have the capacity to cultivate the resilience so that you can have more and more conversations about race and your own relationship, right? As opposed to like an othering, right? Like a theoretical concept about race, like our own actual intimate relationship with the ways that us as white people are, are harming other people without it collapsing our nervous system. And, and I think that we forget that. We, we tend to just think that humans can just tolerate all things, but they can't. And it's important that we're able to name that it, it's gradual. It takes steps and that's okay. It's, it's, this, is the, this, is, this is the journey. You know, this is what it looks like. We can't expect people to wake up and then be in it the next day. Um, that's just not how the nervous system works. Totally. And I think like you, you said a good thing that was something like this is we're learning this in a theoretical way, which is also interesting to learn about racism and white supremacy and anti-racism in a theoretical way, because 
in reality, it actually is very visceral. Oh, this 100%. Work is like somatic, visceral yes. in the body when, when it's bringing up uh, feelings of fear, shame, um, yeah. perfectionism, like, like emotional flashbacks, like, you know, some of us may even have emotional flashbacks from our childhood. If we, you know, get yelled at in an anti-racist pay space, we might actually emotionally flash back to being yelled at as a child or something like that. Yeah. And that's um, why we keep it theoretical, right? That's why we keep it as a mental construct because that's much more tolerable than doing the deep somatic work of actually grounding in our own experiences. And that mentalization is a defense. It keeps us from the intimacy of the problem. It keeps us in a state of allyship, uh, performative allyship. It keeps us in a space of wanting to be seen and perceived as a certain way instead of really grounded in our body and taking action from a profound space of embodiment. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, and I think that, yeah, I mean, there's systemic change that needs to happen, but I think that there also is like a relational change that needs to happen between how white people relate to people of color on a human to human level. And once we're getting at that layer of it, it is about being, it is about that intimacy, like you said, like holding space for all of these feelings that show up, holding, you know, not emotion policing people of color, not emotion policing ourselves not emotion policing other people, uh, other white people as white people, not bullying other white people who are really trying to show up uh, to do the work and putting their best foot forward. Well, so it's a lot. It's, it's a lot that yeah. we have to do. Yeah. And I would like to just pause because you said something that I think may, some people may not know what it means, but I'm curious what you mean. Like, how would you define emotional policing? Yeah. So emotional policing would be like if a person who is, let's say a person of color and they are expressing their authentic uh, pain over their lived experiences with racism and a white person who is hearing this, they actually can't hold space for their pain or possibly it's bringing up feelings of shame within themselves. And so then they launch into the unhealthy fight response, which is to emotion police the person of color and being like, you can't talk about this. You can't, you know, you can't express your pain, but it's actually the white person's problem because they can't hold space. They can't hold space for other people's pain and they can't hold space for their own pain. Yeah. And I think it's, it's really important like for white people to understand also like uh, power dynamics and, and the ways in which people who have been systematically, you know, power has been removed on on a systematic level, of course, they're going to engage in all of the tools that they have access to um, in order to get their voices heard. And, and we see white people policing um, black people. Um, For example, we judged, um, we as in a collective white people judged, you know, Colin, um, Kaepernick for kneeling. We were like, nope, that's unacceptable. And then, you know, we judge the, the peaceful protest. No, that's not acceptable. And so at a certain point, louder actions are going to take place. And just like, you know, when you see anyone in pain, the crying, the, the lashing, the anger is usually not the first step. There's usually so many other things ahead of that, um, that, was missed. And so I think it's really important, like you're saying, that white people not judge black people for how they're, for how they're expressing their pain. I think that that's really critical um, and ground ourselves in like our humanity that like we wouldn't want anyone to tell us how we can experience our pain or how we can experience any part of our lived experience. So why would we have the audacity to do that for somebody else? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, it it goes back to those conversations, too, about protests and riots and whatever. And it's like, it's not the anger that's the problem. It's it's the injustice that's the problem. Exactly. That is is the problem, the injustice. Yes, exactly. And the ways in which, you know, we are participating without questioning it. You know, that is, that needs to be addressed. And I... I'm really grateful for so many amazing voices who are having these conversations, both white people, black people, um, indigenous people, people of color. I think that the fact that this, this conversation, I don't know if you're noticed it, but I feel like this conversation is louder than it ever has been. Um, 
I don't know if it's going to lead to the ultimate changes that would, we would want to see, but it seems like things are moving, albeit slowly. But I do think that it, we have to bring our nervous system with us or no change is going to ultimately be sustainable. Yeah, I totally agree. And I also want to make a point too with like activism, how there is such a thing as activist burnout. And if we're not tracking with our nervous system, we can really um, just burn out and, you know, collapse going to that freeze response and then not want to do activist work for like years, you know, have to take like years to recuperate. And so that's not really helpful. What's more helpful is actually having boundaries, um, practicing self care, tracking with the nervous system saying no, you know, it is okay to say no. Um, And and so that we can like, kind of keep going for for a long time, because it is a marathon, it's not a race. And I think that being respectful to ourselves and other people and tracking with our nervous system is actually going to help in the long run. Yeah, yes, I love that. And I can't believe this the time has just flown by. <laughs> I can't even believe it. Although maybe I can. Um, how are you feeling? Is there anything that we haven't touched on that you want to make sure that we touch on? No, I think this was good. I, I really appreciated our conversation. I really digged it. Yeah, me too. I'm really glad that we can make this happen. And obviously for anyone listening, you know, Laura and I are two white women navigating all of this. We are literally in it with you all. We are figuring this out before we clicked record. You know, Laura, you even shared to me that like you're figuring this out right now, like here. And it's like, yes, so am I. And that's what it means to be human. You know, we are not by any means, um, kind of the the it the goal we are just in the trenches figuring out how to make this feel sustainable for our nervous system and and how to make this sustainable for the world that we want to see and I just really appreciate Laura and everything that you're again putting out on the world um both in the yoga spaces and in the social justice spaces I just think it's really really important message um yeah so thank you Oh, thank you so much. I really, really appreciated our conversation and I feel really honored to be on your podcast, Thais. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Reclaim the Podcast. This podcast represents the opinions of Thais Sky and her guests to the show. The content of this podcast are for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional psychological, psychiatric, or medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified mental health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or mental disorder.